Hi everyone. So this week we're going to talk a little bit about hoof care and some basics kind of surrounding trimming and shoeing the horse. Uh, and so I've laid out a, a number of different shoes and different materials today uh, and I figured first thing uh, we're going to talk about some of these different materials, some of the different shapes of shoes, and then we'll head downstairs and we're going to talk about balance, how to assess that balance, even if it's not you trimming the horse and you have your farrier out, you guys need to be familiar with how to assess balance yourself. Uh, to be sure that it's properly done, okay? Uh, and so we'll talk about kind of that geometric balance, why that horse is standing still versus the functional balance, watching them track and move how they're landing. Uh, and then we'll maybe uh, practice some trimming on a little tool that we have, a blacksmith buddy. And so right off the bat, uh, we could look at a, a number of different shoes. Um, and I think it's important to, to first say that, you know, not all horses need shoes. We shoe for a variety of reasons. Uh, whether that's protection or support or traction uh, or performance uh, and so there's lots of reasons but not every horse needs shoes for majority of horses having your ferry out having them trimmed everything surrounding that uh, for the most part it's a maintenance issue okay you have your farrier out every six to eight weeks they trim your horse maybe you put shoes on for one of those various reasons that's great okay have them out in the next six to eight weeks and so on um, there are the handful of horses that uh, it becomes more of a corrective shoeing okay or therapeutic shoeing uh, and so we'll show you maybe some examples of that on a horse that maybe had navicular or laminitis or something like that and some things you can do to try to help that horse out but that's not the majority of horses okay uh, and so I've got a little shoe board here um, just to point out a couple things right off the bat. Um, and uh, we've got some different uh, sized shoes from some uh, shoes up here down to some large draft shoes sitting at the bottom. Um, but what I really want to point out to you a couple things uh, is whether or not you've realized it, uh, horses' front feet are shaped differently than the hind feet, okay? Uh, and so if you looked at this shoe right here, uh, this is a front pattern, and so it's more round uh, all the way across the toe and through the quarters, okay? If you looked at this, this is actually a hind shoe that sits right here, okay? Much straighter in the quarters right here and a little bit pointier in the toe, okay? Both hind feet are generally going to match and uh, both front feet are generally going to match pretty closely, okay? Um, we can talk about angles of that dorsal hoof wall when we go downstairs and trying to ha assess that. Uh, and so our front uh, pattern and our hind pattern, uh, this sits right there. You can see again numbers of different ones. Hind pattern that sits here, straighter in those quarters, round that sits right here. Uh, you can go out and buy, uh, as a farrier or anybody else, uh, front patterns and hind patterns, and then they're still going to have to be shaped. You're never going to find one of these shoes that you just take out of a box and magically fits that uh, horse. Uh, you might get lucky in that one out of a hundred. Uh, it's going to require some shaping on that anvil to fit that horse's foot. Uh, and we want to make sure we shape the shoe to fit the horse's foot, not just put one of these cake shoes on. Cake shoe is a, another name for kind of this manufactured shoe. We don't want to just put a cake shoe on a horse's foot, nail it on, and then rasp the foot to match the shoe, okay? The shoe needs to be shaped to fit the foot. Well, you can buy front patterns and hind patterns. They'll be a little bit closer. Um, it won't be required near as much shaping. Um, to be honest, most people probably just buy everything in front patterns, uh, and then we'll shape it accordingly. Uh, you can shape things cold. Uh, that's a lot more work on the anvil and a lot more work on your, your arm. Um, or you can put them in a forward and shape them hot, and you can uh, do this all pretty quick, okay? Now, these are keg shoes, like I said, manufactured shoes. Uh, you can also take and uh, make handmade shoes. You might have a farrier that makes a lot of handmade shoes, and so this is a, a set of bar stock that would be used uh, to make a handmade shoe. And so they're essentially taking this, heating it up in the forge, you gotta do this hot, um, bending the entire shape of the shoe, rounding the corners off, taking a fullering tool, putting the crease in here, punching their nail holes, doing all of that in this bar stock right here, okay? Now, this is a little bit higher quality steel, sometimes a little bit thicker as well than some of these shoes. If you set it right beside it, just slightly thicker, about a 16th. Um, this handmade shoe will typically last a little bit longer uh, than maybe your cake shoe. And so if you have your farrier back out, he trims your horse, you may be able to trim the horse and then adjust the shoe a little bit and reset it. When we say reset it, put that same shoe back on, okay, versus putting a new cake shoe on. So handmaids cost a little more, a little bit more cumbersome to make, um, but they last a little bit longer sometimes than uh, your cake shoes. The other thing that we could point out uh, on our little shoe board right here um, is just the difference between 
Uh, right here we've got quarter clips, and right here we've got side clips, and then we've got a toe clip, okay? And so we've got some varying clips on uh, different uh, shoes right here. These clips are actually come on, uh, or manufactured, uh, they're coming on the kick shoe as they are. Um, I, that's okay, you can get them like that more often than not. I also uh, like, and most farriers will draw their own clips, okay? Uh, and so once you get that shoe hot in the forge, you can take a, a cross peen or a ball peen hammer uh, and draw a clip then anywhere you want along that shoe, okay? Clips really help stabilize that shoe, okay? Especially our quarter clips and our side clips keep that shoe from rotating. Think about, uh, we've got it on a, a jumper, and they come off a jump, and then all of a sudden they push off the ground, and then they're gonna change directions and go the other way. When you push, and all of a sudden you land, and you get traction, and you push off and go the other way, these clips keep these nails from just shearing right off, okay? If you didn't have these clips, all of a sudden that shoe and that hoof, that shoe sticks and hits the ground, gains traction, hoof starts to twist and go the other way. Again, you'll shear those nails clean off uh, and take your shoe off with it, obviously, okay? And so they really do help stabilize a shoe. Toe clip can do the same. We have it on this big uh, draft horse, uh, more of a, a front to back motion, uh, keep from uh, shearing that shoe, okay? Uh, and so you'll see this more on some, again, some draft horses like this. Um, and so that's a, a number of different just patterns for you guys to be familiar with when it comes to various shoes. The next thing I would chat with you about just briefly uh, is maybe some different materials uh, and just realizing some different things we could do. Okay, we could probably put a, a whole slew of different shoes up here and talk for ages uh, about why we used this or why we did this. Um, this is again just our buyer stock. We can make that handmade shoe. This real, real quick right off the bat is just a, a concave steel. Uh, you might use this on some polo ponies, a number of other things. Basically already has a crease in it. Uh, we would just have to punch holes. And then this concave steel, uh, it's basically got an angle on it. And so that's gonna sit to the interior, okay? And also help relieve some of that dirt that's inside that sole, okay? It doesn't pack in there near as much, okay? So we've got those two uh, that could be used as bar stock. So we got a number of other shoes. The first thing I would talk to you about right off the bat, a couple other things just on this basic shoe. Um, this is the crease, okay? This crease could be done on a handmade shoe with a fullerene tool, and then you've got nail holes that sit uh, inside that crease. Uh, and so when we talk about traction being one of those reasons that we shoe, um, most of the time, this crease right here provides all the traction we need, okay? This crease fills with dirt. Dirt on dirt provides excellent traction. It's like sandpaper, okay? And it just sticks, okay? Uh, and these nail heads, they're gonna seat down in here pretty flush, but you might have a, a hair bit that's raised uh, on that nail head still. Uh, but again, that crease filling with dirt, dirt on dirt provides excellent traction. So for more majority of our horses, that does just fine. If we need additional traction, we could do things like putting studs or caulks in our shoes, okay? Uh, those studs hammer in, the caulks are gonna screw in, uh, and then when you no longer need them, you could unscrew them, okay? Uh, we could take a, a horse that's maybe on asphalt or something like that and put borium on, okay? We could take some borium that's uh, uh, gonna add traction and put it on the toe right here and on both heel branches. So there's lots of different things we could do uh, to add traction. Now when you talk about this material, we said it's steel, okay? There's other materials that have been used before, okay? This is a pretty heavy material when you look at it in comparison to some others. And so we can set that down. Now this is a goofy looking shoe and a little bit more of a, a plate. We can see some different hospital plates and stuff too. I, I picked this up more to show you for the material, okay? Because it's got so much material to it, this is still lighter than this right here, okay? What is this made out of? This is aluminum, okay? Aluminum is a really, really light material, uh, really used exclusively pretty much on some racing plates, okay? You watch all your thoroughbred racing horses, your quarter racing horses, uh, they're all gonna run likely in uh, aluminum racing plate, okay? It's a much lighter material. Remember, horses follow that weight uh, and it's gonna be a lot easier for them to run uh, with this on. Aluminum is a softer material than steel, so it doesn't uh, last nearly as long. It's gonna have a, a, a much a shorter life uh, on that horse's foot. Um, but it's a, a lot easier to shape, okay? If you go out and you watch your uh, track farriers, uh, they don't need to carry much of an anvil with them, okay? Um, they've got a, a really cool device that just sits on a stand that they can make minor adjustments to and shape that shoe pretty easily because aluminum is a pretty soft material, okay? So those would be our two most common materials, probably aluminum and steel, for what we might have a shoe made out of. The other one that I would throw out to you 
that you might occasionally come across um, is a plastic shoe, okay? Uh, I've seen fads come across social media uh, where all of a sudden there's this new plastic shoe, okay? Um, and maybe you've got Velcro tabs on, maybe like this one, it still has a crease and nail holes, still nails to the horse's foot, um, but what might be some downsides to this, or, or upsides, I guess. Uh, well, it's really light, okay? That's one upside to it, okay? Really, really light. Um, biggest downside to something like this is you can't shape, okay? And that's gonna hold true with any plastic shoe, okay? Uh, it's not malleable like that. Uh, and so, because of that, um, you're not gonna have too many shoes that just fit the, the horse perfectly. Uh, and so, more often than not, you're trying to rasp that horse's foot a little bit to fit the shoe, and that's just not ideal, okay? Um, I had a, a friend, a farrier, that was talking one time about some plastic shoes he bought in um, that uh, somebody had inherited a plastics factory uh, and decided they were gonna start making shoes. Um, and uh, that's probably about the biggest mistake they made, but you'll send a lot of these off to the, the farrier supply stores, uh, and they're usually in a box in the corner just collecting dust because uh, they don't move too often, okay? Um, you got little tiny uh, steel studs on the front just to help with traction because another thing about plastic, if you can imagine, very, very slick material, okay? And so these are in an effort to gain a little bit of traction so your horse isn't ice skating around, okay? Um, but that's one of those downsides to this. In the really, really cold weather, this could become a little brittle as well. Um, they've rolled the, the toe on this a little bit. You'll see some plastics out there. Um, like I said, to me, not used very often. What is a little bit of a hybrid between maybe some plastic and your steel that you'll occasionally see um, is a glue-on shoe, okay? Maybe you have a horse that just has really, really thin hoof wall, uh, or you know they've got some injury on their hoof wall and maybe you can't nail it on, okay? Glue-ons definitely have their place, but a lot of good glue-ons will still have almost a steel bar inside it that can be shaped, and then they're gonna have all of these little tabs that come up, okay? And that can be then glued onto that hoof wall, and that's an absolutely good procedure, okay? That will last for quite a while. Make sure you don't get your finger in there. You'll glue your finger to the horse's hoof wall as well. It's a, a pretty strong glue. Um, but glue-ons definitely have their place. Regular plastic shoes like this that nail on, I'd say not so much, but you'll come across them uh, on occasion. Uh, and so that's a little bit about materials. Got a few other just different shoes that I wanted to show you before we head downstairs and talk about balance, okay? You can build out of a lot of different materials. Uh, this is a shoe that uh, somebody built out of a piece of rebar, okay? You can get some cheap rebar that's laying around and he said, you know what, I needed some sho shoes from my mules uh, and this worked out just fine, okay? Uh, and so they don't need to be on for a long period of time. Flatten the rebar a little bit, put a crease in it, uh, just simply two nail holes on both sides uh, and that works out. And so you can make a shoe out of a lot of different materials, okay? We talked about the horse's foot following weight. Uh, this is one. Uh, that has a little bit of a side weight on it, okay? Uh, and we can put various trailers on things. Um, but when you talk about that, horse's foot follows the weight. And again, if this is on the outside branch of that horse's foot, he might travel a little bit more to the outside than if he did before. And so if he was winging in, maybe if you put a little bit of weight on the outside and it follows that weight, he won't wing in quite as much, okay? He's gonna follow that weight. But there's lots of different things that we can do in terms of shape of the shoe. Therapeutic reasons, okay? We've got uh, some corrective therapeutic things sitting right here. We can do things like uh, heart bar shoes. Uh, we can provide a little bit more support under the heel region. Some horses have very underrun heels. Uh, maybe they've got another injury. They've got uh, something else going on. They need a little more support, okay? We can provide uh, that support for them and essentially put a branch where those heels should be. Okay? Uh, and you got this rigid piece of steel that's nailed to their foot, and now they have that heel support. Okay? Um, maybe you have a horse that's uh, a little laminitic. Okay? You ever see a horse that's laminitic? They rock all the way back on their front feet because it hurts. Maybe you get slight rotation of the coffin bone, and it's really painful uh, for them to stand and put weight on their front feet. So they're rocking back trying to relieve that weight. Um, that can be tough to do in a flat shoe. People have made things uh, similar to this, okay? If you can look at a side profile, the entire thing is rounded, okay? You could nail this on and this allowed that horse to kind of rock 
enroll where they wanted to and find their comfort zone. And so maybe, oh, I feel a little better today, I can roll here, and then all of a sudden I was hurt and I can roll back. And you've got that option to be able to do that. Sometimes you had horses teetering all the time though, and they couldn't get comfortable. And so then you had people come in and they'd make kind of two angles, one sitting uh, flat and upright, and then one allowing them to kind of rock back a little more comfortable, okay? And so lots of options that you could do. Maybe you had a horse that's, uh, you know, a little bit of navicular syndrome, um, and you know, we got a lot of strain on deep digital flexor tendon. So we talk about putting a wedge pad in sometimes or raising that horse up, okay? Uh, making that angle steeper, relieving some of that uh, pressure on the heel region there and that deep digital flexor tendon. There's different ways you could do this. These two shoes accomplish the exact same thing in terms of raising the heel region if you looked at them, okay? And it's decreasing the strain on something like that deep digital flexor tendon. Somebody just achieved it differently. And so not all schools of thought have to be the same, okay? This would probably be the classic approach to something like that. And you can see how it's, again, still regular shoe nailed on, but raises that heel region up. Um, this, if all of a sudden the horse is getting better and you want to decrease it though, and all of a sudden start to level them back out to just maybe a barely a small wedge pad, you've got to rebuild this shoe every time, okay? So somebody said, you know what, I'm getting tired of doing that. Uh, so they took this shoe, and they basically welded a piece of pipe on it. And so now they're going to come out, they're going to trim that horse's foot, remove the shoe, make sure the shoe's off the horse's foot, take this over to the anvil when it's hot and heated up, and they took a hammer and they just started beating this pipe down and make it flatter and flatter and flatter and flatter until all of a sudden we no longer need this shoe. And so this allowed them to just manipulate one single shoe over and over until it was no longer needed rather than rebuild the entire thing. Save them time uh, and probably the, the person a little bit of money as well. So lots of different options that exist out there, okay? Now, I think it's imperative that you guys know how to assess balance yourself. We talk about, again, that functional geometric balance, geometric balance, going down to your horse while they're standing still at the tie rail or next to you, picking up the horse's foot and deciding it, okay? Dorsal palmar balance, front to back, medial lateral balance, side to side. Uh, medial obviously be on the inside, lateral on the outside. And making sure that it's completely flat, you know, the thing about, you gotta remember, uh, the United States and American Farrier Association, they will endorse and say, you know, somebody's passed a certification, we have a journeyman farrier, that says a lot. Um, but how often do you hire a farrier to come out and do your horses and you say, what are your credentials? And so there's no system that every farrier has to go through in the United States. It's not like a, a DVM where you've, you know, passed a set of boards and you've gotten a certain amount of schooling. Um, some farrier schools are two weeks to some are six months. Um, and then you go out and apprentice for a year. Uh, and it's a lifelong thing. And so the, the thing you have to watch out for is somebody that, oh, I went for two weeks and I made business cards to set up a farrier. And, you know, and all of a sudden they start getting up under your horse. And that's fine if they know what they're doing. But if they don't know what they're doing, that's where you have to understand balance. So that's what I stress to you, okay? You have to know how to evaluate it yourself. Don't assume just because somebody says, oh, I'm a good farrier uh, and I know what I'm doing, that all of a sudden they are going to trim your horse properly, okay? We stand by this principle of no foot, no horse, okay? You take off way too much hoof wall, uh, pair out all the sole till you reach red, um, and you're gonna have a lame horse, and that horse is pretty well useless to you now, okay? Till they all of a sudden heal and come back around, but you can do irreparable damage sometimes. Um, and so, again, you have to, one, do your research, ask for references, maybe ask if they're certified uh, farrier with AFA, um, but also know how to assess balance yourself and know what to look for. So I think with that, we're going to head downstairs and we'll take a horse and let's go look at that horse, how to assess balance, and then we'll watch them track a little bit and look at that functional balance. So I've got you down on a horse, and I want to first discuss with you how to assess balance kind of, we talk about geometrically, okay, why that horse is standing still, and then we'll go over and do functional balance and kind of watch them track and move. And so why this horse is standing still, like I said, you need to know how to assess balance yourself, okay? Very common for somebody to start nipping around the hoof wall and become really low in the quarters and then dive back out, and we want that horse to be perfectly flat all the way around. And so when we're picking up a horse's foot, a couple things to note, Generally when we do that, um, and again, we're not going to be able to do it properly because we have a shoe on, but we can still show you that entire process just as we would otherwise. Uh, and so when we have a shoe on, if I go to just look that horse's, or, or set the horse's foot and sight down it to make sure it's flat, all I can tell right now is the shoe is perfectly flat, so that's a good thing, but the practice is the same. When I do that, I pull this horse's foot out and I kind of torque it a little bit where it's no longer straight. And so if you're going to look down it and sight it, 
pick it up the normal way that you would and then switch hands. Hold it with your outside hand, okay? And so now we can hold it and I can keep it in line with that bony column and in line with the horse. And then I can take, let it kind of sit here and I can sight down it and I can say, okay, yes, it's perfectly flat. And again, all I'm telling right now is the shoe is perfectly flat, but that's the process and that's what you can do. And by this, you could see the heel, you could see all the way through to the quarters and the toe, and you could see if you had low spots or high spots. And when you hold it with your outside hand then, I can say, okay, my medial side is a little bit higher than my lateral side, uh, et cetera. Whereas if you torque it out, I really can't tell, okay? And so outside hand. The other thing to keep in mind, I'll show you on the blacksmith buddy here in a moment, but if you're gonna trim a horse, you're gonna work on them, do anything, it's too hard to do that over here off to the side. You can pick out the horse's foot here, but that's about it, okay? Anything more than that, and you want to get under that horse, okay? And we're gonna hold their foot between our legs like this. Make sure you can widen your stance a little bit, bend your feet. I've got it kind of locked in just above my knees. From here, now I've got two hands to be able to work on that horse's foot and wrath, take my hoof knife, do anything I need, nail on, uh, etc. And it's pretty solid sitting in here, okay? And it's kind of locked in just above those knees. But make sure, you, again, you've got a wide stance that if that horse moves around a little bit, uh, you're not gonna all of a sudden topple over, okay? So that's the hind foot. Um, let me just show you ever so briefly. Our front, our hind foot is uh, bare, okay? And so that will be easy to assess. But when we pick it up, we can take this, we'll let them relax that uh, foot a little bit. And then from here, we can just take this, put our leg under it, and I can sight down it, okay? Whoever trimmed this did a good job, okay? So I can tell you by looking at it from heel all the way around through the quarters toe. Now, if you look at the shape of that, you can see it's a little more pointed, okay? See how straight it is in the quarters? And then you've got it much pointier in the toe. And so a lot different shape. You looked at that front foot, even though it had a shoe on it, you could see it was much rounder, okay? Now it's straighter in both the quarters. But all I've got to do is kind of let that horse's foot sit. If they want to pick it back up, that's fine. You're not going to win in a battle against the horse, okay? And so if they start pulling back on you, uh, or they start pulling their foot, um, we're just going to simply take that foot again, try it out, let them relax, and then again we can simply sight it and make sure, again, it's perfectly flat and level. And you could do this on all feet. Remember you're going to go over to the other side, when you walk around that horse, make sure you can either you stay close, put a hand on them, uh, or you walk wide around them, okay? And so with that, let's go do uh, functional balance and watch that horse track. Okay, and we'll see how they land. So now we watch this horse track towards and away from us uh, at the walk, and we'll do the, the trot as well. A uh, little tough to see on video, but uh, we'll look at it this way, and then we'll do a side profile. Uh, it looks like this horse, especially on the right front, uh, is maybe a little splay-footed wings in just a hair, but nothing major. Um, and that's about the, the best we can tell from that. I've tried to slow this down a little bit just for you guys to be able to see. You can see as the horse comes towards us at a trot here, uh, but when it's not straight on and uh, it needs to be a little closer to the camera. Um, but again, overall travels uh, pretty true and straight. Nothing's going to affect gait. Uh, this is a much better view looking from the side profile here. We'll see at the walk and the trot. Watch this horse's foot as it lands. We want it to land flat or potentially maybe even a hair heel first. Um, this horse's foot lands pretty much perfectly flat uh, on the front, okay? Uh, on the hind, it looks like it maybe he lands a slightly heel first uh, and then falls forward. And so I'm pretty happy with the uh, way this horse's foot is landing. I would agree with the same thing on the hind as you watch, you watch the front, uh, pretty much his all at once. Hind slightly heel first. And so hopefully you guys can envision that. But this is a good way for you to be able to uh, assess kind of that functional balance versus geometric balance that we saw as the horse was kind of standing still. So hopefully give you some cool perspectives uh, that you can see here. Okay, so you've watched that horse uh, track now, uh, and hopefully you understand a little bit about how to assess balance both in a geometric uh, sense as that horse is standing still, picking that horse's foot up front or hind, looking down and making sure it's completely flat. And then again, also watching them move, okay? Do they wing in, do they wing out? Is their foot landing flat, medial laterally? Um, or uh, again, maybe it's uh, uh, landing outside first and then falling to the inside. We need to correct that, okay? We want that horse's foot from a dorsal palmer sense to either land flat or maybe slightly heel first, okay? 
So now that we've done all that, I just wanted to show you a few things on this really cool tool that we have right here. I'm standing on something that we call a blacksmith buddy, okay? And this is gonna allow us to have a pretty good teaching aid to be able to pick up that horse's foot, practice trimming on it, uh, literally anything you could want. You can nail a shoe to it, don't try to hot fit it, uh, but you could do about anything else to it, okay? I remember back in the day in farrier school when we used to try to practice getting that hoof wall level all the way around, we would do so on PVC pipe, okay? PVC pipe was really hard to be able to trim and achieve that kind of perfectly straight line on all the way around. And so this is a, a great uh, solution to that. Um, and I'll walk you through some of the tools here in a moment, but just to show you this, they basically built a prosthetic limb um, that flexes um, both at our carpus right here and then also flexes at the fetlock joint, okay? And so you can see both of those joints and how they move and how they flex. They put a little skin on the outside and then these hooves are removable, okay? And all of a sudden I completely wear one out where you can take it off and put a new one on. And so pretty cool. Now we've got this here and so it has tension on it with a gas shock and so just as you saw me pick up that horse's foot before, I can take it and I can hold it just above my knees, widen my stance and then all of a sudden I have good control over it. I can rasp on it, I can nip on it, uh, nail a shoe to it, uh, anything of that sort, okay? So that being said, I pulled a, a few tools out here that maybe even just as a horse owner, if you're gonna do a few things around, you know, you got a horse that pulls a shoe or you need to pull a shoe. Um, or uh, again, you just need to, to again, fix something up that they're you know, cracking their foot and they've got a chip on it now. And you need to take that off and rasp around it, clean it up. Some basic tools that would be helpful to have around, okay? The first of which would just be a set of pull-offs, okay? This is a set of pull-offs used to pull that shoe, okay? So that horse that had a, a shoe on that you just saw a little bit ago, uh, we could take this rasp and we could rasp off the clinches and then we could come over here with our pull-offs, get between the hoof wall uh, and that shoe and just basically rock it off, okay? And it's gonna help us to, as the name implies, pull off that shoe. Our uh, pull-offs, they're always gonna have little rounded nubs on the reins right here, okay? This is just a cheap pair of diamond pull-offs. Uh, you don't need anything expensive, okay? Especially just, uh, again, for the average horse owner. Then we've got the three main tools used for trimming. We've got our hoof knife. This is what we're gonna use on our sole um, to help pair out that sole, make sure that sole stays concave. Uh, there are right-handed and left-handed hoof knives, uh, and there are wide and narrow blades. And so the biggest thing, make sure you get the, the correct one, right hand or left hand. This is how you're going to hold that. And then it's kind of in this uh, C shape or U shape, if you will, and how we're going to uh, do that. I'll show you momentarily. Typically, we're gonna do any work on the horse, wear some uh, farrier chaps or something just to protect your legs, okay? Uh, but you're not nailing, so uh, is one thing better. So that's our, our hoof knife. Um, then we could talk about uh, some nippers. These are hoof nippers made for trimming the hoof wall. I just grabbed two different sets just to show you, um, two different brands. This is, I think, a Nordic Forge and this is a diamond brand neither of which are very expensive at all, um, but they would work out just fine, okay? If you're gonna go out and you're gonna get a pair of nippers, the ideal thing would be that it has a decent drop to it, and so that's when you let go, you see this kind of easy drop that it falls out. Same thing would hold true here to an extent, but see how this one, they get a little sticky, okay? You want something that has a very fluid drop to it, okay? And so you don't want it to have to take two hands to kind of creak in and out to achieve your uh, trimming job. So we've got two sets of nippers here. These are hoof nippers, not made to nip nails. You start nipping nails with these, you'll gouge out chunks along the blade, and then when you go to trim through the hoof wall, you're not gonna get a full bite, okay? Now you're gonna start ripping off that hoof wall. Uh, and so make sure, again, these are for hoof wall only, not for uh, nails. Uh, and then the last thing that we would have um, to smooth everything out, make sure that foot is perfectly level, when we were talking about assessing balance, is our rasp. Our rasp has a coarse side, and it has a fine side, okay? As you could imagine, coarse side takes off a lot more material than the fine side does. We'll show you how you might use this. The biggest uh, thing with this, keeping it in a fluid, kind of a circular motion. We don't wanna just sit and kind of seesaw back and forth, uh, or you're gonna create a, a rut in that horse's foot uh, and get it out of balance, okay? Make sure, that, again, it's got a little area with no teeth on it up at the top. Make sure when you're doing it, you keep your hand off this rasp, okay? New rasp, really dangerous, even this used one, 
uh, you start rubbing your hand on this and it's going to turn your hand to hamburger pretty quick. And so be careful that uh, this is just on the hoof wall. Don't put too much pressure on it. People have a feeling uh, they're going to, oh, I'm just going to smooth out my horse's foot after he threw his shoe. That's fine. You want to round it off a little bit. That's fine. Okay. But you take this and you push way too hard and all of a sudden it gets kind of sticky. Just let it perhaps do the work, kind of let it float across that horse's foot. And so let's show you a couple of these uh, and how that might work in a sense. And so first thing we would do, uh, we can push some of these off to the side, is take our hoof knife. And again, we're gonna make uh, sure some of that sole is removed. You can see how flat it is here. We wanna keep that surface concave. Uh, and this, again, it's plastic. It's sometimes a little harder, sometimes not. Some feet are pretty hard on the horse. But we can take this, make sure your hand stays below the hoof wall. And again, we could use that just to pare out some of that sole, okay? And again, we're gonna come around and do this in kind of a C shape. And so when you're coming towards you, right off the bat, uh, and in the beginning when you're learning, um, I would say, you know, put your elbow here so that when you pull in, if you come back to here, you're essentially gonna elbow yourself. What I don't want you to do is way out to the side and you slip and then all of a sudden you gouge yourself, okay? So if you come in enough to where you can, if you do this, you're just gonna keep hitting yourself, right? And I can't go any further back. And again, just one of those things to be careful. These are knives and brass and nippers, and they are sharp. So you just gotta be cautious of that. We could clean out the commissures uh, along each side of the frog, should we want to. They make loop knives that aid in that. Uh, and so that's your uh, hoof knife. We could take a pair of our nippers. We've taken a lot of foot off of this horse uh, already, right? Our little blacksmith buddy. Um, but we could take this and very easily uh, start to work our nippers through. When you're working with nippers, we're gonna constantly take a half bite, okay? We're not taking a full bite, we're basically overlapping half with the previous, and then moving forward a half bite each time. We could go from heel all the way around to the toe, back to the other heel. Some people would take a piece out of the toe, and then they would work back to this heel branch, and then work back to this heel branch. Doesn't matter the, the fashion up to you, but we're gonna take a half bite each time to make sure we stay in that same groove all the way around. It takes practice to start here and then end up all over here and get that perfectly flat. People, when they're starting out, they wanna take a little bit of heel, dive down low in the quarters, say, oh crap, come back out, you're good in the toe. Dive down in the quarters again, say, oh crap, and you end up low in the quarters, okay? Uh, but that's our hoof nippers. After you've nipped all the way around, which we don't need to do right now and today, we could take our rasp and again, Horse side, fine side. Biggest thing to realize is keeping this kind of in a fluid motion. And so right now, it's only cutting on the forward stroke. I'm letting it just kind of glide back. We can go across our entire toe. But we're gonna let it kind of glide across this horse's foot as we level it all up. And so this takes out a lot of those imperfections from those hoof nippers, okay? We need to take off more foot. We could use our horse side, okay? But you keep it in a fluid motion that we move from here all the way down in one stroke, okay? And then we could come over here if we needed a little more taken off. And we could come back to this, okay? Or you could come back and you could take a little more off this heel branch. But we want to continue to work all around that foot, not just one spot and seesaw back and forth. Make sure on occasion you look and you assess that horse's foot, okay? Take your outside hand and basically sight it to make sure it's staying level, okay? We didn't talk a whole lot about angles. The biggest thing I tell you right off the bat is generally that shoulder angle should match our passenger angle, should match our dorsal hoof wall angle, okay? That's a pretty good rule of thumb, okay? And so with that, hopefully you guys learned a little bit more about various shoes, assessing balance, these blacksmith buddies, uh, and you're more equipped with uh, hoof care. And so with that, we will see you next time.